No Place for the Dead by Con Connick. Gil stared at the blackness above him. Another painful creak sounded from outside, ripping through his skull like a child through a birthday present. He pressed the pillow against his ears once more in a vain attempt to block out the noise. Still, it echoed into the cabin, only slightly muffled by the cotton beneath his head. Something else had to be done. With fluttering eyelids, Gil peeled the blanket off of his torso and shuffled to the edge of the bed, not daring to take a glance through the window. Grasping around in the darkness, he found the handle on his bedside table drawer and yanked it open, pulling out a matchbox from the clutter inside. Striking a match against the side of the box, Gil scooped up a lantern from the floor and stuck in the flame, casting a brilliant orange glow across the room. The walls shifted back and forth in his hazy vision as he leant over to put his boots on. He stood up and rubbed his temple, taking slow, heavy steps to the door. A quick glance towards the mirror on the mantel showed Gil the scruffy, stubbled face he expected, coupled with a mop of shaggy hair. He wiped the crust from his eyes with his free hand as a crack of thunder whipped through the sky outside, a flash of lightning shining through the window against the pouring rain. The storm had been raging on for quite some time now. Gil slipped on his coat and pulled out his keys. The wood was cold to the touch as he grabbed the doorknob firmly, bracing himself for the unpleasant conditions. Taking one last look at his warm, comfortable mattress, he drew in a deep breath and flung the door open. The door slammed shut behind him in the howling wind, immediately drenched, Gil held up the lantern and squinted through the rain across the river. A thick layer of fog was floating over the water, clouding the far-off mountains ahead. His fishing boat was furiously rocking back and forth, barely held in place through the fierce winds. Taking a few steps forwards, he could just barely make out the shape of his net sliding back and forth on its hook. Every time the wind blew, the hook would creak as the net swung just barely above the ground. But Gil could tell there was something wrong. The net sagged more than it usually did. There was something else caught in it, something much bigger than a fish. Keeping the lantern at the end of his outstretched arm, Gil furrowed his brow and approached the shape, fighting against the diagonal rain. Soon, he could make out the pale silhouette of a hand shining against the soaked wall of the cabin, illuminated in the moonlight. With a dramatic boom of thunder, a strike of lightning lit up the icy pale body tangled in the netting. There you go, Sam! Gil's face lit up in the sunlight as the fishing rod bent slightly under Samuel's grip. The water rippling as something thrashed and wiggled beneath the surface. Grabbing the reel, Samuel huffed and puffed as he leaned backwards, trying to pull the fish up towards the boat. Suddenly the line went slack and Samuel sighed dejectedly as the fish swung away, disappearing out of sight. Ah, it's all right, son. You're getting really good at this, you know? I bet you're real in the next one, no problem, Gil reassured, ruffling Sam's hair. Leaning over to one side, Gil fished through the small chest, picking through the various metal hooks and colorful baits. Samuel frowned slightly as he noticed a dark murky fluid floating beside the boat. A thick fog had swept across the lake without warning, blocking out the view of the cabin. The substance slipped effortlessly between Sam's fingers as he dunked his hand into the water. It was warm and strangely syrupy, like a splash of treacle had spilled into the lake. A quiet gasp escaped Samuel's mouth as he came to a horrible realization. He couldn't free his hand from the water. The fluid had completely enveloped his fingers, wrapping tightly around his wrist. He had tugged lightly at first, quickly becoming more frantic as the substance's grip became tighter and tighter still. Hearing Sam struggling, Gil turned his head from the baits, raising an eyebrow at his son. Before Samuel could even get a word out, he was thrust violently into the water. Yelling incoherently, Gil scrambled over the edge of the boat, freezing cold water splashing over his body in a second, and Sam's muffled screams were barely audible as Gil swam deeper and deeper, swiping desperately at the water but never meeting his son's hand. The water was suffocatingly black, like an oil spill, clouding Gil's eyes. 
Air bubbles slipped from the corners of his lips as he grimaced, slowly losing hope. One last cry could be faintly heard beneath his feet before everything went silent. Gasping for air, Gil pushed himself back to the surface, his tears of anger washed away in the bouncing tides of the lake. The air was thin and misty as Gil strained the oars against the water, his fish bucket empty as it rocked against the side of the boat. It was a frosty day, and Gil's hands were pale and numb as they held the fishing rod. Again, the water was strangely thick this morning, almost like treacle, and the surface was colder than it had been. In a spot where the previous days had been dozens of fish, today there were none. A creeping sense of dread swept through Gil's body, intensifying as he scanned the water once more, darting his pupils across the surface. The mist parted slightly, revealing the familiar sight of Gil's cabin sitting peacefully amongst the trees. The wooden exterior was damp and brown, as it usually was, giving the cabin an aged look. Gil lay down on the boat, trying to distract himself from the chilling occurrence of the night before by gazing absently at the clouds above. Taking another good look at the cabin, Gil suddenly felt something off. It wasn't the cabin specifically, more another disturbing detail that seemed to give his mind the slip. It was like looking at a spot the difference puzzle, knowing there's something wrong, but being unable to see it. Gil shuffled apprehensively towards the front of the boat and leaned forward, trying to make out any significant difference. Was it the porch? The storage shed? And then he saw it, facing towards him, another body tangled in the fishing net. The same one he had encountered last night with even paler skin and the deadest, almost empty eyes he had ever seen. Gil stared completely still. The roar of a dying engine snapped him back into the present. Large puffs of blackish smoke were rising over the distant hills, moving closer to the cabin with each passing second. With a burst of dreadful realization, Gil picked up the oars and slammed them in and out of the water furiously the boat slowly gaining speed. Just as it hit the mud at the front of his porch, a car rolled around in the dirt, leading to the cabin. It was a bright red convertible, the sunshine bouncing proudly off its smooth surface. In its driver's seat was a young man of about twenty, with a much older woman beside him. Gil rushed towards the net, almost slipping on the watery shore as he jumped out of the boat. It was in plain view of the dirt road ahead, and the car was closing the gap quickly. Finally, he reached it, panting like a dog. With a firm grip on the slim body, he hoisted the net upwards off the hook. The fish spilled outwards through the gaps in the netting, leaving a trail as Gil waddled as fast as he could towards the river. Behind him there was a soft splutter of something mechanical, and the audible click of a car door popping open. Two pairs of wet footsteps were approaching Gil. Inhaling sharply, Gil threw the net as far as he could towards the river, a mighty splash soaking his coat with a thin layer of water as the body sank down under the weight of the net, its crooked face pointing down into the murky depths. Excuse me? A high-pitched voice sounded from behind Gil. Turning sharply, he was met with the sight of a freckled man with light hair and a nervous smile. Hey, my name's Joe. We were just passing by, but our cars decided to have some engine problems, and we've got an underinflated tyre. We don't want to bother you, but do you have a pump we can use? I think I'll be able to fix the engine, so that's okay. A grey-haired woman with a pearled necklace was stepping slowly across the mud behind Joe, trying to keep on the grassy patches of the ground. She was small and thin, with dainty feet like a ballet dancer. She looked up at Gil and winced through the sunlight. Come now, Joe. We don't want to bother the man. He's probably very busy. That's uh, fine, Gil mumbled. Producing a key out of his pocket, Gil placed it in Joe's palm and gestured towards the storage shed. Thanks. I'll be right back, Gran. Okay, honey. The woman replied, as Joe set out across the mud. A faraway bird cawed out into the air, amidst the quiet rustling of the nearby trees. More clouds were blowing over from the east, edging ominously closer through the sky. The movements of the water were slow and methodical, 
splashing against the shoreline constantly. Gil wiped away the small beads of sweat that had formed on his head and swallowed, relieved. It must be nice to live so far out here, away from all the hustle and bustle of the city, the woman said to Gil. Gil nodded slightly and shuffled a little closer to the water. She sniffed and glanced around the shore. There was a grave just poking out from around the corner of the cabin, with a wooden cross sticking out from the dirt. She opened her mouth as if to say something, but after a moment of thought, shook her head and closed it again. Tucked under the porch was another fishing boat, lying upside down with cracks in the hull. Again, the woman took a sharp breath, about to begin a sentence, but caught herself before she said anything. I'm Margaret, by the way. And Joe's my grandson. He's a good kid. Do you have any family around here? Margaret spoke with an easygoing tone that was soft and low. Gil didn't respond. Not much of a talker, eh? I suppose living in isolation can do that to you. No offence, of course. I'm sure you've seen a fair number of interesting things around these parts. My grandmother told me about the waters around here once. She smiled that classic old woman smile, with a knowing air and sense of warmth. You stay away from the waters down by the cabin, she would tell me. Margaret continued. Those waters are something more. More than what we know and what we think we know. Those ain't natural waters, Margaret. You stay away from those waters, you hear? That's what she'd say. She'd never tell me what she meant by any of it, of course. Never made any sense to me. And it still doesn't make sense to me now. Suppose it was just ramblings of an old-timer. But Gil wasn't listening. He was paying closer attention to something rising up from the water, being swept closer to the shore by the ever-mounting current. A single finger was bobbing up and down on the surface, slowly revolving around and around as Margaret's eyes widened in horror. A deformed head with dark, empty sockets slithered out of the soggy netting and flopped onto the shoreline. The body's arms and legs followed, broken and burst, attached to a battered torso rolling onto the mud, its skin peeling away to reveal rotting bone and muscle. Gil stared sorrowfully, and Margaret gagged, raising her hands up to her mouth. The netting soon followed, piling on top of a heap of flesh, soaked red with watery blood. The pair stood deadly still for a while, taking it all in. Margaret was frozen solid, her head tilted back slightly as if she were about to pass out. Eventually, Gil forced his hand into the confines of his coat and unsheathed the thin brass pole, one he had planned on using as a replacement for his worn fishing rod. Now it would serve a different purpose. Joe pushed the rusted equipment and broken tools out of his way, scanning the shed for any signs of a pump. The room was dank and musty, and the shacks, many crevices, were coated in cobwebs and grime. It was quite sad in a way, seeing all this useless junk rotting away in silence, never to be used again. A monotone ringing slowly edged its way into Joe's ear. He sighed and took out his hearing aid blowing on it and wiping it on his sleeve repeatedly. Still, the sound was scratchy and quiet as he put it back in. There was a sudden crack that rang across the air, like the sound of a whip, but Joe ignored it. Scratching his chin, he took a final look at the room. No pump here, just half-rotted wood and bugs. The door creaked as Joe pushed it open, and the sky outside had seemingly got even brighter and Joe shielded his eyes for a few moments before looking back at where his grandma had been standing. Margaret was sprawled out across the ground, her head split open and her face buried downwards in the mud. Gil stood suddenly over her corpse, holding out a red-tipped rod in front of him like a sword. Joe's mouth dropped open. In a moment of panic, he screamed, trying not to collapse in shock. Within a second... Gil was halfway across the mud to Joe, sprinting towards and brandishing the rod with determination in his eyes. Forcing his legs into action, Joe turned on his heel and fled rapidly into the forest along the shore, screaming and crying. 
Gil followed closely behind at first, but was gradually losing his edge on the surprisingly fast man. Dodging trees and bushes, Joe wiped away the tears pouring down his face, the rustling of dead leaves behind him constant reminder of Gil's presence. Gil had his eyes focused sharply on Joe as he ran, hot on his tracks, but eventually lost him through the dense trees and foliage. Soon, Joe was out of sight completely. Out of stamina, Joe dug behind a thick trunk tree and tried slowing his breath. He could just make out the distant noise of Gil's footsteps on the soil. There was a faint crackling in Joe's ear, followed by another monotone ring. Before he could even reach his hands up to it, the hearing aid fell out, landing in a patch of mud. Joe scooped it up and tried to brush off the dirt, but it had already seeped into the speaker. His heartbeat quickened as he placed it into his ear. Gil's footsteps were much closer now, and seemed to be coming from all directions at once. Trying to run, Joe's legs felt like jelly, and his throat was raw and painful. Staggering around between the trees, he peered around the branches trying to spot Gil. He was stuck. Everything went deadly silent. The hairs on Joe's neck pricked up, not a sound in the air. Even the trees seemed to stop swaying in the miraculously absent breeze. Joe pressed himself up against another tree, trying to make his lean frame as small as possible. In the void of sound, something caught Joe's eye. Like a vision, concealed by the fog on the water far away. A shadowy being. Like something from a child's nightmare. It had no eyes. No tangible sense of a head or even a face. But Joe could see it was looking right at him. The air was knocked dramatically out of Joe's body as Gil smashed into him, thrusting him down onto the soil, Joe's head becoming half-submerged in the lake. The rod flew out of Gil's hand as they landed with a thud on the dirt. He wrapped his hands around Joe's neck, breathing raggedly through his nostrils. Joe wheezed and spluttered, struggling against his firm grip. Icy cold water flooded his nose and ears as Gil shoved his head fully into the lake, turning his skin a pale white. Joe reached for the rod but it was mere inches from his grip. Water splashed onto Gil's sweaty palms. He winced and turned his head away, staring aimlessly back into the forest. Joe kicked and strained and pushed as hard as he could, but Gil kept the upper hand. It wasn't long before his limbs turned limp and his eyes creaked closed. It was over. Gil sat up, wiping the sweat from his forehead. The sight of Joe's twitching corpse was almost enough to make him throw up. He swayed unevenly as he stood up, examining his work with morbid curiosity. The life had drained from Joe's eyes, and his throat was red and patchy. Leaning against a tree, Gil picked Joe up with shaky hands and tossed him into the lake. I'm leaving, Gil. With teary eyes, Gil stared open-mouthed at his spouse, unable to speak. You've torn this family apart. I can't stay here any longer. Rose, too, was crying, her once sparkly eyes now watery and broken, a scowl painted on her lips. Rose, Rose, you, you, no, please. He was our son, Gil. Our fucking son! Rose shouted, a suitcase in her hand. I tried to save him, Rose. I swear I tried. It wasn't my fault. I... Then whose fault was it, Gil? Hm. You were a literal inch away from him, and he just slips off the boat and fucking drowns. It wasn't like that. There was something else, Rose. Something in the water. I saw it down there, pulling him under it. This again, you fucking imbecile. You're delusional. No. This again? You fucking imbecile, you're delusional. We've lived here for years, Gil. And today, for no apparent reason, something just drags him into the lake. I know, I know how it sounds, but shut the fuck up. Shut, shut up, shut up. Sh this isn't... I can't stay here. Not after what you did. I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. I have to go. 
Pushing past Gil, Rose stormed out of the cabin, her hurried steps getting fainter and fainter as Gil slumped down onto the floor, his face in his hands. Step aside, sir, the officer repeated as Gil stood firmly in front of the cabin door, arms at his sides. I assure you, officer, there's nothing in there to cause alarm. I've told you everything I know. What's your name, anyway? The sun projected shadows along his uniform, casting him in darkness. His face was that of a no-nonsense man with bushy eyebrows and a constantly furrowed brow. A neatly combed crew cut sat atop his head, and there was a well-groomed moustache lying above his upper lip. It's Daniel Winters, and if there's nothing incriminating in there, then I'm sure you won't have any problems with me taking a look inside. This is private property. Do you have a warrant to search my residence? Winters took a long inhale in through his nose and held it for a second. There's two ways we can go about this, sir. I can have you detained for failure to comply, or you can let me investigate your own. Which is it going to be? Gil sighed deeply and looked at the floor. He stepped to the side as Winters pushed his way in, pulling out a notebook. Upon first glance, the room did not appear to stand out in any particular way. There was a queen-size bed that sat at the very end of the cabin, with a wooden desk pushed up against the wall on the right. A small painting of a serene landscape was hung near a bulletin board, with photographs pinned down with unused fishing hooks. The only slightly abnormal feature was the oddly absent space in the corner of the room with no furniture. Tell me again how you saw the woman and the boy, Winters asked, beginning to jot things down. It were mid-afternoon. I were hanging up fish in the net outside. They pulled over and asked me for a pump for their tires, which I gave them. I helped the boy pump up the tire and wave them away. That's it. Gil reluctantly shared once more. Who's this? Winters questioned, jabbing an accusing finger at the small child in one of the pictures. The boy was sitting on a fishing boat with Gil smiling warmly at the camera whilst Gil held up a sizable fish in his arms. That's my son, Gil replied, a little hesitant. Winters scribbled down a quick note. And where is he now? Gil leaned back against the wall and gave Winters a blank look, one which seemed to mask a deep sadness. Oh, I see. Who took the picture? My wife. She's gone too. Right. Winters stepped over the desk. Pencil drawings were littered everywhere, some spilling onto the floor. He sniffed and picked a couple up in his hands. One was a panoramic view of a peaceful lake, but with an odd scribble in the water in the distance. The other was seemingly a zoomed-in illustration of the scribble, which took form as a dark figure half-submerged in the lake, its body large and rugged. With a worried glance at Gill, Winters put the pictures down. Well, there's nothing here to suggest you committed any crime. I suppose I'll be leaving. Don't give me any reason to come back here. Just as the officer started to walk back towards the door, a mighty splash rang from outside. Gil tensed up as Winters froze, his hands on a pistol by his side. The fuck? He mumbled quietly. Creaking open the front door, the officer peeked around the corner of the cabin drenched in water, with patches of rust adorning its body. A bright red convertible had rolled onto the shoreline. Its tires were a little more than wet scrapes of rubber, and shards of broken glass were scattered along the waterlogged seating. The front bumper was hanging off the hood, showing an upturned engine lying inside. There was a sharp thud as Gil brought down his lantern onto Winter's skull. An intense throbbing pain coursed through Winter's head as he gradually faded back into consciousness. It was dark now, and the trees were shadowy and motionless in the lake's reflection. Tilting his head down, he saw ropes tied around his body, pinning him to the edge of Gil's porch. Gil was sat down a few meters away with a lantern by his side, his head in his hands, a pistol on the ground next to him. Ma motherfucker! Winter spoke up. Gil tensed without looking up. Get it over with, you prick. Shoot me already.
Gil stayed completely still. What's the matter with you? Huh? Huh? Do it! Fucking shoot me! Winters thrashed around fiercely, veins bulging from his temples. Through gritted teeth, he flailed his bloody head back and forth, trying to loosen himself from the rocks. Removing his hands, Gil tried to force himself to look at Winters. His eyes were watering, his face numb with regret. Do you see it? He finally spoke with a shaky voice. He pointed across the lake, gesturing to a cloud of fog looming in the distance, floating on the surface of the water. Over there, in the fog, you saw the drawings, didn't you? That thing. It took my son, Daniel. It took my fucking son. Gil ran his hands through his hair as beads of sweat began to drip down his forehead. We were out fishing and... and it sucked him under the surface and kept him there until he drowned. Rose blamed me. Said it was my fault. Winters sat still with his mouth hanging open slightly in awe. He tried to formulate some kind of sentence but was too dumbfounded to think properly. I couldn't have saved him. I tried. I swear I tried. She wouldn't believe me. No. How could she think that? How could she think it? I would just let him die? It wasn't my fault, Daniel. It wasn't my fucking fault. Gil stood up, his fists clenched by his sides. His speech was becoming increasingly hurried and slurred. The grave by the cabin, it's, it's fucking empty. I dug it for Sam. When I found him in the net, I thought... I thought he was giving it back to me. I thought I was letting him find peace. But no. It stole him from me again. Only to wash him back up broken and, and deformed. Hanging upside down in my own fucking fishing net. It made me a murderer, officer. A murderer. Yo's breathing was rapid. He paced back and forth, the pistol hanging loosely in his palm. I, I have to get away from this place. I have to find Rose. You can't know I'm sorry. Could you, could you just close your eyes for me? Gil spoke softly, a single tear rolling down his face. Winters was speechless. He stared aimlessly at his restraints. Then, the water once again. Eventually, he rolled his eyes shut, flinching in anticipation. Gil covered his face with his other hand as he fired the gun. Winter's limp body flopped onto the mud. A bloody hole opened in his forehead. There was a firm knock on the door. Gil sat still, his back pressed firmly against the cabin wall. He gazed aimlessly out at the window, not moving a muscle. Gil? Gil, it's me, Rose. Gil blinked slowly, still caught in a daydream. The door creaked open gradually as Rose stepped into the room. She glanced silently at the husk of what was once her lover. Empty as he sat unmoving still, his eyes wandering across the wall. Taking a few strides around the room... Rose felt her eyes well up once more as she examined the damage. The floor scattered with broken wood and torn paper. Gil's hands were bloody and splintered, and as pale as the moonlight. The bed had been torn apart, with claw marks on the sheets like those of hungry wounds. Ripped photographs and drawings caked Gil's desk. Rose recognized a few as she tried to piece them together again. I've killed people, Rose. Turning to face Gil, Rose stuttered repeatedly, stiffening with sadness. I killed a young man and his grandmother. I killed a police officer. Rose crouched down next to Gil, placing her hands on his face. Still, he could not bear to look at her. This is my fault. You're not well. You can't be. I had no idea any of this would happen. There's something out there, Rose. It took our son, and now it's controlling me. It's making me do these things. 
I haven't slept in days. All I see when I close my eyes is the smile of that poor kid. And the old lady's face buried in the mud. Come with me, Gil. We'll fix things. We'll make everything right again. We can't bring back Samuel. Rose stood up, turning away from Gil. She sobbed quietly, trying in vain to mask her tears. You have to leave, Rose. I've been having... visions. You have to leave and never come back. This place is cursed. I'm too far gone. You'll die if you stay here. I'm not going to leave you to just rot away, Gil. You're coming with me. And you're going to get better. LEAVE! He yelled, shooting up from the bed. The light from the window slowly faded as Gil felt something wicked grip his soul. Rose's body slipped into the darkness, leaving him alone once more. The walls stretched upwards infinitely, transforming into a great sheet of black. He pushed himself onto the bed, wanting to scream, not being able to push any noise out from his mouth. Joe's drowning cries echoed in his head. A cloud of suffocating darkness bled through the floorboards, hovering above him like a gloomy rain cloud. Gil smashed his head against his fist, begging for the demon to be expulsed. Picking up his splintered bedpost, he swung frantically at the cloud, trying to ward it away. Joe's dying screams began to blend into those of a more female host, intensifying every time he swiped at the demon. Without warning, it all cut away. Gil collapsed in exhaustion, feeling something wet on his face as he lay down on the floor. The darkness had vanished, and he slowly managed to regain control of his body as he pushed himself upwards, his eyes blurry and stinging. Wiping away the sweat from his brow, his legs wobbled. He wiped the liquid off of his cheek. It was blood. Rose's battered body was slumped against the wall, large dents in her skull. Bone and muscle poked out from her limbs, her eyeball had popped out of its socket, it now lying on the other side of the room. The bedpost was caked in excessive amounts of red, sticking out from the shattered window. Broken glass littered the floor, slicing into Gil's naked feet. Gil approached the carcass of his wife, caressing her bloody cheeks as tears poured down his face. Sitting up with a frightened gasp, Gil found himself once again in bed. Hadn't he just been awake? Did Winters exist? Did Margaret and Joe exist? Was it all a bad dream? What's wrong, honey? A silky smooth voice suddenly spoke up from beside him. He reached for the lantern only for it to flicker on all by itself, instantly illuminating the room. Rose was laying by his side. Her long, flowing hair poured down her arms and shoulders sexily, a glint in her seductive green eyes. With lips pointed upwards into a warm smile, her hand touched Gil's shoulder. Gil instantly felt a thousand times lighter. Just staring at her smooth complexion made his heart flutter. His smile began to fade as he realized Rose was crumbling into dust. Her skin was turning to an ashen grey, and large chunks of what was once flesh were now collapsing and breaking apart. Weeping, Gil reached out to stroke Rose's face only for her head to drop onto the floor and shatter instantly. Rose was gone, reduced to a pile of powder. Saddened, Gil threw away the covers and dropped to his knees onto the floor. A bright red light was suddenly cast through the blinds. Peeking out of the window, he instantly felt an overwhelming sense of joy. The fog in the water had lifted, and he could finally see the sheer beauty of the monster in the distance. And oh, it was beautiful. A sudden realization washed over Gil. He didn't need Rose. All he wanted. No, all he ever needed from now on was to be with the being. To be a part of it forever. Gil suddenly found himself outside. His face was twisted into an expression of pure ecstasy. The sky was a piercing red, and Gil could suddenly feel himself being beckoned towards the lake. 
Staring into the water, Gil's reflection spun and shimmered into three other faces. Margaret, Joe, and Winters. They too had bright beaming smiles written across their faces and one by one, whispers escaped their mouths, drawing Gil closer and closer with each passing moment. Dad? A small voice perked from below him. It was Sam. Gil's eyes welled up with happiness as he embraced his child, inching deeper and deeper into the lake. Daddy's here, Samuel. Daddy's here, he whispered softly, stroking Sam's blonde hair. The water passed over Gil's head, submerging him entirely. All right, let's get to work. Allison said as she shut the car door. You hope we don't find anything too grisly, Jack mentioned nervously as they walked slowly towards the cabin. The lake was a beautiful sight in the early morning sun. Orange waves were cast over it, with no fog or mist to obstruct the view. Don't worry about it, Allison reassured him. We never usually find anything when looking for a missing officer. Jack scoffed. That's not exactly too comforting either. Allison chuckled slightly as they approached the cabin. She went around the back, whilst Jack narrowed his eyes slightly and approached something on the porch. Nothing particularly interesting back here, Jack. You see anything? She shouted from around the front. No answer. Jack? Allison repeated, turning the corner. Jack was wide-eyed, staring at something caught in the fishing net. Getting a closer look, Allison gasped loudly. Caught in the fishing net, with water still dripping solemnly from his soaked, lifeless body, was Gil.